Although there's no cure for the virus yet, researchers in Germany have developed a faster way to detect Zika. A new DNA test can tell if a person's been infected within two to three hours of giving blood. The company says the World Health Organization has expressed interest in the rapid test kit. I'm joined now by Katherine Jacobson from George Mason University. She's an epidemiologist researching viruses and their effect on societies. It's always great to have you on the broadcast because you help put everything in perspective. Um, my colleague Elaine Reyes talked to doc Dr. Marcos Espinal of the Pan American Health Organization earlier today. And I thought maybe this might be a good way to frame our conversation. Maybe listen to what he had to say and we can bounce off, use that as a springboard bounce off that. So let's listen. You cannot conclude fully that it is uh, the cause of microcephaly is Zika because there might be confounding factors. There might be other factors that are influencing. There are viruses that produce also microcephaly, cytomegalovirus, rubella virus, toxic agents, chemical agents we can produce. So the studies need to be done. We cannot rush the information. But that doesn't mean that while we wait for the confirmation, we don't do something. And, and this is a key point that the people are saying, oh, it's linked, but, but there's no real certainty about this, is there? Right, the science is still very early in trying to understand whether Zika is related to microcephaly and how that mechanism works. So what uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization said that I think is really helpful is, our level of alarm is very high right now, so is our level of uncertainty. And by declaring this state of emergency for public health, what that's doing is releasing resources that will let us track the infection more aggressively so we can try to understand it faster. The WHO really getting out in front on this one, though, because you've been on the broadcast. We've talked about mm -hmm. Ebola. They were kind of a little slow to move on that. Uh, it's been very impressive how they're moving on this, isn't it? And I think part of what they've learned from Ebola is the need to try to get ahead of situations, even when the science isn't quite there yet. What we're going to see in the next few weeks is we'll see a lot more cases of Zika. And the reason for that is that WHO is now going to be supporting some surveillance where we're going to be looking for cases in as many countries as we can. So one of the things to watch out for is when those cases come in, it doesn't necessarily mean that the actual number of cases is higher this week than last week. It's more that we're finding them. And that's really important at this stage to know how widespread is it? Is it potentially linked to microcephaly in places outside of Brazil or where we've seen this link before? You, you mentioned Brazil, and it's interesting. I went back and looked uh, in May of 2015. You were on this broadcast sitting in that exact mm -hmm. same chair. We were talking about dengue fever at the time in Brazil. There was a huge outbreak at the time because of all the standing water. There was a lot of things contributing to it. Are we seeing kind of the same thing this time around? We are definitely seeing uh, the same sort of thing in that they are spread Zika and dengue by the same kinds of mosquitoes. The good news is Brazil has had lots of practice with mosquito control. And so the 80s mosquitoes, they're going door to door, they're using insecticides, they're putting into practice for Zika what they already had experience doing with dengue fever. And when you, what you mentioned on that broadcast, which I thought was interesting, I mean, when you think about it, it makes sense. There's kind of a period where you're going to see mosquitoes biting people, and it's going to come and it's going to go. So how long a period of time are we going to be looking at this as an issue before perhaps the mosquitoes aren't uh, breeding to such a degree? And there are seasons, and so clearly in the United States, our mosquito season is when it's summer here. Uh, Brazil does have some seasonality with when mosquitoes are, are common. It's not quite the same level of disappearance there in their colder season because it is still a tropical area. But what we will see is the mosquito population will decrease as these initiatives for mosquito control are implemented more widely. So the transmission of Zika should go down in Brazil fairly fast now that there's this really concentrated effort to support uh, insecticide use. During the Ebola outbreak, uh, you came in, gave a great presentation here, and, and it was very interesting for us as journalists because you were saying, journalists are all looking at this, but perhaps you should be looking at this. And I, and I always like to look at it from an epidemiologist's point of view. So as you watch the Zika story unfolding, what are some things that we should be keeping our eye on, and what are some of the things that are being talked about that perhaps we shouldn't be, or aren't that interesting to you? Well, one of the things that I think today we're talking about is the sexually transmitted case of Zika. From a biological standpoint, in terms of understanding how does the virus work in the body, uh, what kinds of modes of transmission would be possible, that can be very helpful. From a public health perspective, that's not going to become a common mode of transmission. Uh, and so when we're seeing potentially a lot of concern about that, uh, we have to remember that mosquitoes are going to be the primary source uh, for almost every infection of Zika, and that's where we want to focus our prevention attention. If you have a friend who's pregnant, she wants to travel, what advice would you be giving her? 
At this point, it really depends on, I would say, that person's level of comfort with uh, being really aggressive about preventing mosquito bites. If a woman is pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant in the near future and says, I'm not sure I want to travel, I would certainly support that person's decision. Uh, at this point, the World Health Organization is not saying that there are travel restrictions anywhere. They're saying be careful and use that insecticide. The CDC is being a little bit more aggressive and saying there are certain places where we know cases are happening and maybe you want to postpone your trip. Uh, until the science is, is caught up with some of these uh, travel requests for, for information, we're just going to have to be cautious. One of the things that was interesting in our last conversation when we talked about dengue, you were talking about there perhaps was a vaccine in, in the not too distant future. Would it impact uh, Zika? They are similar. They're both flaviviruses. Uh, and so there may even be some cross reactivity, which, which means that when we do the tests, we may get a positive hit for one disease, but it's actually a related but not quite the same disease. Unfortunately, I think that the a vaccine potentially for dengue would not be something that would be helpful for Zika. It's going to be a while till a Zika vaccine is available because the testing for anything that might be given to pregnant women will need to be really, really rigorous. We need to make sure it's safe. Catherine, always great having you on the broadcast. Thanks for coming in. Thank you.